All right, hello everybody. Um, we're, we're at the hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started for the sake of time. Uh, so welcome to today's webinar on standalone stretchable device platforms for human health monitoring. Uh, this webinar will be conducted by Dr. Larry Chang. Uh, Larry is an associate professor here at Penn State University main campus. Uh, his email is provided below. Um, so just a couple things to go through real quick before we turn it over to Larry uh, for the webinar. So the first thing that we're going to do here is this, this webinar is hosted by the NAC Center. Uh, so NAC stands for the Nanotechnology Application and Career Knowledge uh, Center. And this is a resource center as a part of the National Science Foundation. Uh, it's an ATE regional center for nanotechnology education. Uh, it's a subsidiary of the CNEU, which stands for the Center for Nanotechnology Education and Utilization, uh, based in Penn State's College of Engineering. Um, in the Department of Engineering Science and Mechanics. So we are recording this webinar and after the fact, this will be uh, posted. So if you enjoy the webinar, you'd like it for future access, we will provide that. Uh, one, one thing regarding the Zoom controls. So there may be two types of questions throughout the webinar. There may be questions like, I can't hear the speaker or I'm having issues with Zoom. Please use the chat for Zoom related issues. Alternatively, if you have technical questions based on uh, the content presented today, please use the Q&A. Uh, we will field your questions in the Q&A and when uh, Dr. Larry uh, pauses for a break, we will ask him your questions. All right, uh, my name is Zach Gray. Um, I am with the CNU along with Vishal Saravade. Uh, we will be your host today. And then our presenter again is Dr. Larry Chang, uh, who is a professor at Penn State. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Larry for the webinar. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Zach, for the kind of introduction and uh, the nice uh, invitation here. It's really my great pleasure to uh, be here and share some of the recent uh, results we have been doing at Penn State in terms of the stretchable sensors and device platform for health monitoring. And before I get started, I just would like to thank all of the efforts from the students who did uh, every single uh, piece of the work. I just get to be here and talk about them. And they have been fantastic before COVID and after COVID. And they made a, a huge contribution uh, together with the funding support we have received over the years. And now let me move on to talk about this type of wearable devices that can be flexible and deployed onto the skin surface. And this is the type of device that can be uh, easy to integrate the human's body. But of course, this is probably not a proper reference, but if we look into 1930s, Darley had this famous painting, the persistent memory, where the watches, the devices are perceived to be soft and deformable. And nowadays we know that's much easier. If you think about the bark of tree, it's really bulky and rigid. But if you think down that to a piece of paper, it becomes very flexible. So that's really a trick that we can apply for every single material even uh, silicon chip and many other things. Or if you think down the material to a few tens of nanometer, it becomes something like a spaghetti noodle. And of course, that's not something sufficient for our application when we would like to apply that, that onto the collinear geometry, like the heart, the different internal organs, the skull, the uh, fingertip, the joint area, and the much larger definition and the collinear geometry will make that to be very challenging. So that's why we also explore the stretchable structure and that serves as the key to make the device to be stretchable and eventually transfer onto the target geometry of the complex shape. So the idea is kind of simple as well. If you think about straight wire, it's not going to be stretchable, but once you made that into a spring geometry, it becomes stretchable. You can stretch that and unfold the geometry. So the idea got implemented here, we use not only the silicon-based electronics, but also make them into this island uh, device. And they are interconnected by the wavy serpentine pretty much like the spring. So if we stretch along any direction, the spring will unfold and come the large deformation applied to the system, avoiding uh, the breaking down of the device. And this is working over multiple cycles, as you can see in the video where the LED on, uh, light is on all the time without uh, degradation. And this can also be applied onto the skin surface for us to capture all the vital information. It can be useful for the, for example, human machine interaction. 
like the device on the screen to capture the vital sun, uh, like the muscle signal, where we'll be able to modulate the flying of the uh, drone wirelessly within the room. Since here is only a few uh, simple commands, we'll be able to control the drone, take off, fly forward, make a rotation, and come back, land on the ground. And this is kind of a noisy video. So let me just show you the very first few uh, seconds, and then we'll move on to talk about how this concept can be leveraged to uh, the house margin. If we replace the battery with LED, we get to use the stretchable LED for illumination for optogenetics operation. And you can use this for many other sensors in terms of hydration sensors, screen sensor to detect the tissue uh, that go into opposite direction of growth to develop into a cancer cell and many other things. And you can also monitor the temperature and also the temperature array uh, will allow us to do the uh, mapping of the uh, temperature variation and also to capture the blood flow underneath the skin surface. And we can also reverse the electrical signal uh, movement to the stimulation. Then you can drive the electrical field to the human body for the pain relief, uh, wound feeling process and many other things like that. It can also help us to provide the stimulation so that we can combine actuation together with sensing to close the loop for the closed loop design. And that can be very useful for the future uh, virtual reality, uh, augmented reality. And uh, in terms of wireless transmission, we can use both near field and uh, long range operation. And near field communication can include the so-called NFC chip and they can, uh, be very uh, effective for the operation of the data and energy transmission up to a certain distance, you know, about one or two centimeters. So it provides a natural security, but of course it's limited to that certain distance. And if you want to go further, you probably need to use something from a radio frequency antenna and many other things I will be sharing uh, momentarily. And in terms of system integration, we can integrate sensors with wireless circuits so that we'll be able to demonstrate, for example, smart electronic eyeglasses and the gas sensor to analyze the breath, the skin perspiration, and to integrate everything onto the internal organ, like the heart, the bladder, so that we can model the cardiac function, the bladder uh, function. And in the disease condition, we'll be able to trigger that to uh, get the urination and everything uh, is stored in terms of the function we would like to have for that particular organ. But looking into the future, what we are more interested in is not really on the individual level, but also mm -hmm. to the population, because that's more um, uh, meaningful in a way that we can get information across the put uh, particular population and to get a baseline analysis and be able to have much better uh, or informative decision uh, for that disease diagnostics or treatment options. And we can also do a personalized medicine because you get to know the baseline of the individual and also get that compared with the population in general. And that being said, we have been focusing on these uh, three different research thrusts. One is the nanomaterial composite that can give us the highly sensitive and selective detection of biomarkers in terms of something we can detect from the uh, biofluids, uh, whether that's from uh, blood, sweat, and uh, interstitial fluids, uh, we'll be able to do that. And the other component is a low-cost manufacturing approach. We would like to make sure that it's easily uh, scalable and also low-cost, so we'll be able to make that widely available and make that uh, accessible for everyone to use. And the third one is to integrate the sensors with wireless transmission module in terms of energy and data and get that into a standalone system. But of course, the battery and the power source will be another key area. So that's why we're also working on this energy harvesting module to harvest ambient energy so that it can be leveraged to charge up the battery super capacitor for extended operation, or it can be useful to directly drive electronics without the need for the power uh, battery replacement or uh, power uh, drainage. So that being said, let me just move on to talk about each of those uh, one by one. So in terms of sensors, uh, we have been working on both the biophysical and biochemical sensors. I'll just take a few as we present the examples. Gas yeah, sensor is very important due to multiple reasons in terms of health biomarker from the skin perspiration. You can detect glucose, 
uh, level and many other toxic gases from the ambient environment as well. And then you can also use this to detect the local environment change to know whether the person is exposed to a target uh, uh, toxic gas and be able to alert that before it's too late. And the accumulated information in terms of nitrogen dioxide will also help us to provide the treatment and also uh, patient uh, progress in terms of the time. And that's why we typically do that environment for uh, COPD patients, so chronic pulmonary obstructive patient. And that can be very useful for those uh, different uh, uh, lung-related disease applications. And because we are more interested in the detection of the gases biomarker from this local environment, we would like to have this on the human body to capture the local gas environment rather than that is fixed in the building uh, of the particular location. So that being said, we have been very interested in this uh, wearable gas sensors. And people working in this area have been uh, trying to look at, of course, nanoparticle because it can provide a highly sensitive uh, detection due to the specific area that is very high. And of course, you cannot just use a single nanoparticle. Of course, that's uh, the ideal case, the connection of that nanoparticle to the external circuits for the data collection and analysis can be very challenging. So that being said, the field is focusing on the development of the interdigitated electrode and then apply the nanomaterial across the surface and bridge the, uh, bridging the gap and be able to provide the information in terms of the uh, gas molecule change. However, that gets to a very uh, undesirable uh, uh, compromise because you would like to have a really high resolution so that you can ideally have just a few nanoparticles in between the fingers but that can be very expensive to manufacture. And even if we have a uh, high-end manufacturing approach, that would be very expensive. So that def uh, defeat the purpose of the low-cost uh, manufacturing. So that's on one side. On the other side, even though we would like to use this on the skin surface, but slight increase of temperature can speed up the absorption and desorption. So the detection of the gas molecule can be in real time. And this, Slightly increased temperature does not need to be very high, and also we can use thermal isolation to make sure that does not create an adverse effect onto the human body. And that's the reason why people typically integrate the uh, heater to uh, uh, the system for the uh, enhanced performance, but that both uh, creates the uh, increased complexity. So that being said here, we are going after a different approach. It's called the laser-induced graphene. And this, Graphene-like material is highly porous with a lot of defects. Of course, it's not ideal for the transistor application, but this defect actually provides a huge benefit for us to detect the gases biomarker due to the selective and sensitive detection of the target biomarker. And the highly porous structure with the uh, big uh, microstructure pores from a few micron to a few tens of micron can facilitate transport of the gas molecule uh, moisture through the layer. And also you get to see the smaller size, a few nanometer to a few tens of nanometer on the cellular wall. So that can also increase the uh, sensitivity and transport of the gases by molecule. And through that process, we'll be able to uh, decorate the surface further with a gas sensitive nanomaterial and be able to detect the target uh, biomarker. And everything will be uh, uh, wearable. So we can apply this on the skin surface. And you probably notice a color change is to modify the surface of this interconnect region of the serpentine shape. And that further reduce the uh, resistance from a few thousand ohms down to a few ohms. So when you pass the current to marrow resistance, and you will create a huge um, localized temperature increase because of the dual heating. And that eliminate the separate heater from the beginning. So everything will be simple as a single wire, but we will be able to integrate the highly sensitive detection with the heater from the self heating. So that gives us a really nice uh, platform to detect biomarker in terms of different gases. And we'll be able to go after nitrogen dioxide for COPD patient. And we can also go after the other uh, VOCs in terms of uh, those commonly used for the health condition, uh, volatile uh, organic compounds, and we can get all the signals transmitted and analyzed on the local smartphone or on the cloud, and that can be done either way. And of course, when we are looking at this platform, it does not need to be limited to a 
particular substrate, even though this is like burning the material into carbon black, and if you tune the material prime, uh, laser parameters right, you will be able to get the pulse graphene. But it's still limited to some of the material. So here we explore the uh, so-called black copolymer that can be spin coated onto different substrate. So for example, the textile, different clothing, and you'll be able to create a gas sensor on this polar structure, and that can create a fully uh, breathable gas sensor. And we can also analyze the breaths from the different uh, patient population. That's the uh, way we can differentiate, for example, COPD patient from the healthy individual. And of course, when we get to apply the sensor for different application in terms of temperature detection, motion detection, some of the signal can be compound together and creating a challenge to differentiate them or the detection of one will be affected by the others. So that's why I will try to go after some of the sensing application or the sensing mechanism that can help us decouple uh, the signal. For example, one of the recent work we haven't published yet is to decouple the gas from the temperature and this is done in a very simple manner. For example, the material encapsulated by a, a gas permeable layer will allow the gas to transport. But if you encapsulate that with the gas impermeable layer, and that can block the gas and only sensitive to the temperature. But if you use our self-heating and heat up the material, and then the ambient temperature variation will have minimum effect on the uh, streams on the gas sensor that's the time you can detect the gas in a very highly uh, selective manner. On the other side, we can also detect the uh, glucose or the other biomarker from the sweat. And to do that, we have to do the uh, electroplating process. And this is very challenging, uh, to be honest, because the rough surface, the highly pore structure, just prevent the uniform coating. So that's why the student here have tried different parameters, different processes, and to optimize everything so that we can still maintain the highly pore structure, but also create a relative uniform and uh, sensitive uh, coating layer. And here we use gold and nickel, and the compound provides a highly sensitive and selective detection of the glucose. At the same time, they can be uh, low cost from this uh, electroplating process. And we can further integrate this with a uh, uh, microfluid device to collect the sample of the sweat and analyze that at the target location. And this is really the optical image of the device on the skin surface. And we can detect the uh, current density and correlate that information with the glucose concentration. And we can further modulate the morphology from the foam onto the fiber to further enhance this uh, sensitivity. And speaking of the sweat collection, and uh, here is one. Uh, represent example where we can uh, take the sweat through the inlet and get that uh, routed to different chambers for analysis of pH, glucose, or different biomarkers. And in a traditional design, two outlets or uh, two uh, openings will be needed. One is for the inlet to get the sweat into the chamber, and one is the outlet to uh, pass the uh, liquid out. But with both openings will increase the evaporation and reduce the accuracy. So here we introduce the hydrophobic valve that can help us collect the sweat with just one opening. And the process is very simple because everything else will be hydrophilic. So the sweat will naturally whack onto the surface. And this is the schematic on the top. And this is the actual image where we get the biofluids to go into the chamber gradually and fill in the chamber eventually. And then the pressure will build up and to be a level that is very close to sweat pressure. It's about 2.4 kilo Pascal. And if you design the bursting pressure or the opening pressure of the valve to be slightly smaller than a value, and you will burst open the uh, valve and continue to move on to the next chamber. So that's what we see here. If you have multiple chambers, and the sweat will be collected sequentially in each chamber, and there's minimum mixing in between the two. So that's why you see only the red dyed water in the first one, and there's only a blue dyed water in the third one. And by using this color change, you can also do the measurement in terms of pH or the other biomarker as well. And without electronics, you will be able to directly see the color change. Of course, you can also use smartphone to detect the RGB value and create that information in a much more accurate manner with the corresponding change in the biomarker. So that can be done either way. 
And of course, the idea is really based on this valve where we can uh, allow the uh, uh, collection of the sweat, but also uh, pass the gas uh, outside and that avoids the uh, accumulation of the pressure and be able to uh, allow a successful collection of the sweat. So this is also a cartoon we created to help the younger generation understand how this is working and also be able to uh, stimulate their interest in the STEM education. And moving on, let's talk about some of the surface modification. If we want to work with the sweat, we probably want to engineer the surface in different manner hydrophilic versus hydrophobic, where you can modulate the sweat to be collected and analyzed in different manner in different uh, location. But on the other side, we can also combine this idea to create a much more accurate sensor. So for example, this super hydrophobic sensor can be very useful in the highly humid condition, but the small moisture or water molecule can still condensate on the microstructure and to damage the super hydrophobic structure. So that's why here we combine that with the highly conducted maxine layer. And that provides the way for us to drive just a small voltage and to create the uh, local heating. And that dual heating um, creates a very large temperature increase and drive off the moisture outside. So the maxine layer, as we can see, without heating, will just accumulate a lot of water mo uh, mo molecules and then the thickness will be increased but if you will uh, increase the temperature through the dual heating and it can maintain a really robust uh, structure and so from that direct comparison in the relative humidity of 70 percent if you don't have heating and it's going to drift quite a lot in terms of the signal admirer but if you have heating it's much more robust and we can do the humidity and water moisture insensitive uh, detection of the motion. Uh, that's really something uh, more useful in the all weather condition where the people can engage different activities. And furthermore, let me just switch gears slightly to talk about the uh, radio frequency antenna for the wireless transmission of data over a much longer distance. And this can be well beyond a few centimeters of the NFC, but rather go into tens or hundreds of meters away. And in the past, people have been using this mostly as a sensor because this is different from a sensor uh, in terms of structural design because if you design a structural sensor, as long as the sensor is not broken, you will still be able to get a sensor to work to detect the temperature, uh, bell marker, and different things. But for antenna, it's going to be a different story because stretching will change the dimension and the antenna will be operating at the resin frequency. That is roughly, inverse proportional to the dimension. So if you stretch the antenna, the antenna will be operating at a, a smaller resonant frequency. You can shift out of the Bluetooth or the radio frequency range you are operating with, and that's not going to work. So that's why with this resonant frequency change, people use that mostly for a screen sensor or temperature sensor, if you use that to uh, uh, be induced by the temperature. And here we can do that same thing. And of course, we use our stretchable design to create a patch antenna. And we have much higher radiation uh, efficiency, close to 90%, which is about 30% higher than the others. At the same time, we can have much uh, more accurate detection of the motion. Um, but that's really not really the uh, end story because we want to design this to be robust for the wireless transmission of data. So that's why we are trying to look at different designs and to replace the top arc with the serpentine. But it's working in a different way. And the resonant frequency, as we can observe here, one is increasing with deformation and the other is decreasing. So that's the initial time my students were thinking whether we can combine the two. And that's what we did. We create the arc and the arc itself with a lot of serpentine structure. And we have a much smaller variation, but still is not uh, constant. And that's, not uh, helpful uh, to the end application we have in mind, but rather here, we can actually uh, modulate the structure from one arc to a 3D uh, uh, arc with uh, two arcs. So here it just help us open up the opportunity for a 3D antenna because a small variation in the shape can actually help us modulate the radiation property of antenna drastically. So here we're able to demonstrate the sensitive uh, detection um, of the magnitude, which doesn't matter, but the resonant frequency is not changing with the stretching level. 
So that gave us a really a nice band for the wireless transmission of the data energy. And we can modulate the uh, resonance frequency to work with in form of pre-stretch we used to create this arc. Or we can apply this uh, on different uh, body location. You can modulate the resonance frequency through the size. And through the size design, we can modulate that to be around 2.4 gigahertz. And that's the band for the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And we can use that to transmit the data or energy. So in one example, we did transmit the energy from the uh, transmitter on the human body to a receiver that is on a moving vehicle. And you can do that on the other uh, uh, side as well. You can transmit energy from a moving vehicle to the human body. And this energy can be transmitted over hundreds of meters away. And the typical challenge with this type of antenna is a lot of uh, absorption from the human body because the water molecule inside the human body will also naturally resonate around 2.4 gigahertz. So a lot of energy will be absorbed and leaving a very minimum one for the powering of the device. And here we use the uh, design of this patch that can allow us to have minimum effect from the lossy tissue of the human body. So that's why we get to see the performance in the unbody case is pretty much the same as the freestanding case. And next, we can further modulate the uh, shape from asymmetric uh, to asymmetric. Even this small variation can help us further enhance the performance in terms of average received power to be bumped up by 50%. And the data packet loss rate is reduced by 50%. So we'll have much more uh, energy transmitted and lower uh, error rate from the data loss. And we can attribute that to the enhanced gain so this is a way to characterize the performance of antenna. In a 2D case, the peak gain is about like 1 dB, but if we change that to a 3D antenna, it got increased to uh, increase by about 50%. But if you further change that from symmetric to asymmetric design, the peak gain got increased about by another 100%. So that's really the reason why we're able to achieve even better performance with a small change in the shape. And of course, we are now explored all of the parameter space in the 3D antenna, but this opens up the totally new area for us to explore in terms of 3D antenna. You can do a lot of different designs and be able to further enhance the performance way beyond what we are demonstrating here. And furthermore, we can harvest the energy because the radio frequency energy in the ambient environment will be something can be very useful. If you don't use them, they will just be wasted. So we combine the radio frequency antenna with a rectifier. It can rectify the AC type of energy into a DC power. And we can use that one to charge a supercapacitor or capacitor in this case. And the capacitor can provide energy for the device. And so this is the actual demonstration to use that charging for the supercapacitor. And the charged supercapacitor can provide a stable uh, energy source for the devices or sensors to detect, for example, the pulse from the human body. And we can have this continuous moment of the pulse signal uh, without uh, a need to worry about the battery replacement. And further, we can design the antenna that is not only going to operate stably, but also you know, very high weapon because energy we combined together over this band can be integrated together to further enhance the energy uh, 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 conversion efficiency. So this is the simple demonstration of the radio frequency antenna combined with the other devices. And we have combined that energy uh, to go through the rectifier and then be able to get that information uh, into a DC power. And this is a quick um, demonstration with the energy emitted from microwave oven. So it's ultra small. So the input power is probably around one microwatt. And this is much lower than the other energy sources, but we were able to harvest energy at an efficiency about like five to 10%. And this is not that dramatic if you look at the number alone, but the theoretical limit to this uh, conversion is about 0.3% because the bare uh, dials is not even turned on in most of the cases. So that's why here, the Wideband antenna is super helpful. It can combine all the energy that are small, but to integrate them together to get a much higher energy. So if we are looking at the energy spectrum from the microwave oven, from the hotspot of the 
smartphone and we'll be able to say it's not really at a single uh, peak, but rather with energy distributed uh, around it. So when we have the wide band, we can combine all the energy together and harvest that into a DC power like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 uh, volt from the environment. And it can also harvest energy from this Wi-Fi or uh, the uh, hotspot of the smartphone. And of course, if you have much higher input power and with the ambient uh, uh, environment, it's probably one microwatt. I think it's negative 30 to negative 40 uh, dBm if you do the conversion of the unit. And if we have much higher efficiency, uh, if we have much higher input power, like the uh, uh, zero uh, dBm, so that's like uh, million watts also, and you can have uh, efficiency up to 60 or 60 or 70 percent. So in practice, practice, if you are working with the device in the office space in a building, and you can have much higher efficiency to charge up your electronics, wearable devices uh, in a very short period of time. And of course, the 3D design can also help us enhance the performance, and that's really something similar. So I'll just skip this one and then probably leave some time for a question in terms of uh, the things we have presented so far. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Larry. So yeah, if anyone in the audience has any questions, uh, please do let us know. Okay. Um, so are there, are there any ways to store the data with the stretchable sensing element on the body? And would you please comment on the stretchable memory elements? Yeah, excellent question. So currently, I think most of the people have been working on the wireless transmission of the data. So in you know, a way that to get that data transmitted onto uh, the smartphone or data logging device directly, and not much on the uh, direct storage of the data. But on the other side, this can be very beneficial because if you can store the data, analyze the data on board, uh, you don't need to transmit all the raw data, and that can be power efficient and save a lot of energy. And so there's also a separate effort where people start to work on the memory-based device for the data uh, uh, logging. And that is not something we have done so far, but uh, it can be done because the stretchable structure I introduced is a rapid, uniform, uh, and universal strategy. And it does not need to be limited to any materials. And you can use all of these uh, structures to uh, work with, for example, the semiconductor material, uh, conducting material, uh, dielectric material. So it's easy to use the same structure uh, to create a stretchable uh, memory device and then combine that with the uh, circuits we have. But on the other side, you can probably use, for example, so I think we can go back here. Uh, on the other side, uh, there's also other efforts to uh, combine the memory device together with the processing units where you can uh, do the processing at the same time. And that's really something uh, uh, very promising and to be integrated. But again, here, uh, the system is certainly very complex and the design of the uh, elements and the integration of these different elements into uh, the complex system can be a bit challenging because we want to make sure the device is small footprint. And then you can not only uh, apply that on the skin surface, but also potentially implant those inside human body to do the wireless transmission and data analysis of the condition that cannot be directly collected from the skin surface. And that actually gets to something I'm going to present next. But that's really something very interesting in terms of what we really would like to do. And that's probably something depending on the application. If you have a particular application, we can certainly design the system accordingly to make sure everything will be satisfied uh, in terms of the requirements and be able to design a system that will work best for that target application. Awesome, thanks, Larry. Um, so yeah, why don't we keep going here with the presentation and then uh, we'll field the remaining questions at the end. Sure, that sounds great. So here, let me move on. And here, uh, let's get back to the previous things in terms of uh, what we would like to do with the implantable devices. And for implantable devices is something very uh, important and helpful because we can detect the information from inside the body. You can get inaccessible information that uh, very challenging to detect from the skin surface and the signal will be much higher, stronger and the correlation you can establish is not, not something you can do with the epidermal devices. 
And of course, on the other side, there's a particular unique opportunity if you can design these implantable devices to be biodegradable as well, because they can safely dissolve inside the human body after operation, and that can eliminate the second surgical operation to remove them. It's not only about removing the device that is there, but it's also about the foreign body response while you have the implantable devices for a certain period of time and they will just grow on top of the device. So physically removing the device is impossible and that will create a lot of damage. So if the device can be safely dissolved after operation, for example, patient recovers from the surgical operation and uh, heart transplantation and those different uh, operations uh, got successful and patient recovers fully and there's no need for the device to be there. So safely dissolving the device can be super helpful. So from that perspective, we design electronics that can dissolve eventually, and that relies on the set of functional materials. For example, substrate, we have to use uh, silk, PLJ, synthetic polymer, but there's a lot of those in from tender wrap, rice paper, and those type of biodegradable materials can all be leveraged. And for interconnects, we simply went to the drugstore and found out we are actually taking in magnesium, tungsten, uh, zinc and those type of uh, conducting materials in our daily intake. And the challenge really comes from the electronic components in terms of the semiconducting materials. And the silicon is a backbone of the DNA of the modern electronics. But luckily, uh, not every single material uh, uh, we use is this uh, uh, helpful, but silicon is biodegradable. It can safely dissolve in the biofluids in a very small rate though. And the degradation rate is about like one or two nanometer per day. But if you design everything to be a small thickness, it can be managed. So for example here, if we design electronics to be uh, small in the thickness, it can safely dissolve after a few days, weeks, depending on the uh, design. And more importantly, and the silicon and the corresponding material we use in electronic components are much smaller in the daily intake. Uh, uh, because for example, the silicon in our daily intake is about like 10 milligram and the silicon we use in our device is about three microgram. So a thousand times smaller of the silicon will create minimum uh, diversity effect on the human body. And of course, if you have every single material to be biodegradable, the device may not even be functional. And that's why we want to make sure a device will be able to stably function for a certain period of time, say a week, a year, or sometime you have in mind, and then safely dissolve. So here, if we are looking at magnesium, it's not going to dissolve that uh, slowly, but rather something that will happen within half an hour. But if we encapsulate this uh, 300 nanometer magnesium with 400 nanometer magnesium ox oxide, you can extend lifetime uh, to about three hours. If you double the thickness to about 800 nanometers, it can increase lifetime to about 10 hours. But of course, that's not really something uh, sufficient for many of the applications. So we can further engineer the overcoat from the silk. It's pretty much like the ring jacket and you put onto the device and that will protect the device for even longer time. And for example, five days, that's probably sufficient for many of the surgical operation while a patient will recover. And if one layer is not enough, you can do that over multiple cycles and be able to have much uh, higher, um, a longer period of time. But of course, something we have in mind is more on the environmental or friendly electronics in terms of the smartphone that can safely dissolve. And in essence, you are not creating electronic waste, but rather something you can create uh, with a functional uh, property during the lifetime, but after you get a new smartphone, the old smartphone can be simply uh, flushed down to the toilet to avoid electronic waste. So from that point of view, we are a bit uh, behind in terms of timeline, but uh, the critical challenge is not really with this material, but rather if we use the pocket and how we make the ceiling in between the edge and so that water will not leak through from any single reaction. So there are different ways to do that and there are still efforts uh, working along that direction. But yeah, the good thing is uh, we are uh, getting closer and closer uh, in the past few years. And the device can be demonstrated uh, in terms of all the complex device architecture and different uh, device uh, combination. But here the idea is to show we can do all the single components from 
conductor, transistor, capacitor, inductor, and then in principle, you can integrate all of this together into a platform for the demonstration. And this is the sequence of the image to show how that got resolved. We have seen the video, so we'll be able to skip that over. But if you design the circuits based on that material, we'll be able to detect, for example, the brain signal uh, when you implant that into the brain or on the surface of the brain. Uh, we can monitor the internal pressure and temperature of the intracranial space. And you can also do that something similar for the heart and many other internal organs. And after operation, they can safely dissolve. And today I'm just going to focus a bit more on a different manufacturing approach. And this is the so-called xenon light. And xenon light is very useful because it provides super high energy and is super fast to operate. And they can be very useful to center uh, nanoparticles together into a conductive pathway. And this works with a lot of different nanoparticles because the wide band of this uh, xenon light from 200 nanometers to uh, 1200 nanometers in terms of the spectrum. So that's why you don't need to modulate the laser as the others, but rather here you can shine the xenon light uh, over zinc, silver, copper, gold, and the other different semiconductors can be working as well on diverse substrates from glass, plastic, polymer. And this can also be low cost if you work with the go to application. So this is super nice. And initially we tried to use this one for the application of zinc nanoparticle because zinc is biodegradable. We want to center that into a, a conductive pathway, but we find out the challenge with that is zinc oxide on the outside surface will actually be uh, detrimental because that material layer is not conductive. Centering will be hindered and also the conductivity will be compromised. So here, one interesting thing uh, my student found out is when he use zinc nanoparticle and shine a xenon light and the material will be centered in a very nice way and also get deposited onto the target geometry, whether flat or curvilinear in 3D geometry. And this is simply because only the uh, zinc got transported onto the target geometry and the zinc oxide will be left behind. So it's probably easier to see from this SEM image with the zinc oxide on the outside surface and we shine a xenon light and xenon light will create a localized heating and the heating will expand the nanoparticle in terms of thermal expansion. And zinc has different uh, thermal expansion from the native oxide on the surface. So it will crack open the surface and zinc with a lower uh, evaporation temperature will be transported through the cracked surface onto the target geometry and the zinc oxide will be left behind. So that help us create a highly conductive zinc uh, uh, pathway and also uh, to get that deposit onto different geometries. And if you would like to work with that material, you can use the chemical exchange to transfer, uh, uh, change the zinc to silver or copper. And that can be very interesting uh, to use for long lasting devices. But let me just show you how this is working on the planar geometry, on the glass, uh, the polymer, uh, plastic, of the other different things commonly used in the lab. And we can also do this on a 3D geometry. And with the karagami design of the carrier substrate, we will be able to transfer the zinc uh, pattern onto the 3D glass beaker. And we're able to create the hydration sensor electrode for electrophysiological signal detection, dipole antenna temperature sensor. And the signal is very high quality to allow us to detect, for example, cold water, hot water, empty of the beaker. And you can detect the relative humidity of the ambient environment. And the dipole antenna can also transmit the data to the outside. And this is, of course, not only useful for the beaker, but also potentially useful for many other uh, objects because we can transform all of the daily objects into a smart objects to create a smart internet of things to get them all connected, interconnected with each other. And this is also working on a rough surface. For example, the zinc pattern can be uh, provided on the seashell with a really hierarchical structure. And we can create the same batch of the electrode, uh, temperature sensor, uh, hydration sensor, antenna. And here we also create a uh, gas sensor to detect the nitrogen dioxide. And 
I didn't uh, have the time to go into all the detail, but if you're interested, feel free to check out the corresponding reference here. But let me just move on to show what we can do with some of the 3D devices. One simple demonstration is to have that uh, electrode on a 3D uh, uh, petri dish. And here we try to use that one to showcase the idea of electrical impedance tomography. That's going to be complemented by super high spatial resolution, but very slow to obtain. And here EIT is much higher in the temporal resolution. We can do imaging about a thousand frames per second. So that's why in the future, we try to use this one for the early screening and then problem the corresponding patient for the MRI for the later uh, diagnostic confirmation. But here is the simple demonstration where we have the petri dish with uh, chicken meat. And then if you take out the chicken meat from the petri dish, you can immediately see the uh, video capturing that event. And you can do another one and you'll be able to see that to emerge on the computer screen. And then putting them back, you'll be able to see the recovery of the signal. So that's a quick demonstration of this EIT. And then moving on to some of the demonstration of the device level from the single sensor, we can move on to the sensor network. So on different body areas and to help us create a body area sensor network. And from that perspective, we try to integrate the sensor with the wireless transmission unit. And the particular thing in this work is to have everything fabricated through a very simple manufacturing approach and the material is all based on super nanoparticle. And super nanoparticle is very hard to, sin uh, to center because the temperature will have to be over uh, 300 to 400 degrees C. And here we use a sintering egg layer with different nanocomposite material inside. And we try different things again and that are provided in the uh, uh, paper. But the idea of that one is uh, the sintering egg layer with a very sticky material property will be able to fill the holes of the structure and be able to provide a smooth surface for us to integrate the or print the circuits that you can uh, do from direct printing, stamping, and different things. Uh, on the other side, the super nanoparticles printed on the surface will be able to interact with the nanocomposite in the central aid layer. And this is done through what we uh, thought of as a solid state diffusion and the sewer particle will be uh, interacting with this uh, nano composite through a very thin layer of the geometry. And that layer is about like one micrometer or so. So even though we disperse the particle up to tens of micron, but only that one micrometer will be interacting with the central aid layer and be able to get centered. And this after thing geometry is really helpful because it becomes much more flexible. So we can not only do bending, folding, and origami, origami design, but also to integrate our sensors and the wireless transmission modules on that piece of paper. And we can also do that on the skin surface. And this is actually very simple. We can use, for example, printing, stamping on the texture skin surface. Of course, this ink will have a lot of uh, uh, solvent inside. So to evaporate that, we simply use a high dryer and then you can evaporate solvent and leaving the nanoparticle based uh, device on the skin surface. And the sensor uh, we can do include temperature sensor, hydration sensor, uh, blood oxygen detection. And this all provide a performance comparable to the commercial counterparts. And more importantly, we can even do better in this um, electrochemical, uh, sorry, electrophysiological sensing in terms of ECG, EKG, EEG, because the contact impedance got reduced at a very small frequency range. And we can have even better signal noise ratio due to a good contact quality, uh, have a better performance and robust performance against motion artifact. So for example, if we have the motion artifact from stretching, deformation, twisting the skin, and the signal will be distorted with the commercial gel electrode. And that's why patient will have to be immobilized on the hospital bed without uh, the possibility to move. And for our sensor, patient or individual can engage in different activities while still be able to collect the signal altogether. And we can integrate this sensor from, uh, uh, with the other uh, modules in terms of drug delivery, an electrochemical sensor and electrical stimulation. And this can also be designed to be waterproof so that we'll be able to detect the signal in the air and also under water conditions. 
And further, we can design everything to biodegradable, uh, particularly for that central aid layer, because that is still uh, so sticky and they can provide better performance, but it's going to be very challenging to work with the child, like the infant or the elderly, because they typically have very delicate skin. So in essence, we design this uh, central A layer to be biodegradable at the elevated temperature. So if you wash that in a warm water flow or in a hot shower, it can be washed away and you don't need to worry about the damage on the skin surface. Looking into the future, uh, we are trying to integrate the sensors with wireless transmission module together with the energy harvesting unit to provide a standalone system. So in a few represent demonstrations, we combine, for example, the tribal electric nano generator with the supercapacitor, and here the stretchable micro uh, supercapacitor, and we can harvest energy from different uh, motion. Uh, for example, when Mulan is practicing a martial art or when we are doing different activities and that activity will uh, create the kinetic motion, kinetic energy, but that's not really continuously uh, output. So we can harvest energy and store that energy in a stable energy source in terms of supercapacitor. And then you that one to drive the uh, string sensor, electrochemical sensor. So this is one of the demonstration with everything based on the uh, laser induced graphing. And we can uh, power the device with the supercapacitor as a constant energy source. And we can also use, for example, the other modules in terms of radio frequency energy, as I introduced before. So in the future, we are trying to develop this as, for example, a Lego like platform. You can use different modules, plugs onto the system platform and be able to harvest energy and power the device in different ways. And it can be easily adapted for different applications as well. And for example, if you have motion to drive the circuits and the person engaged in a different activity will be able to generate the power and be able to power the device and to operate for a much longer time. If that person is not uh, moving at all, the power will quickly uh, dry out. So that's really one demonstration to show what we can do in terms of this long-term operation with the standalone device system. But looking into the future, I think it's much more promising when we have this standalone system, we'll be able to deploy onto the healthy individual for healthy aging and also uh, on the different disease population and be able to monitor the onset progression of the disease condition and also to evaluate the treatment uh, response on those individuals as well. So given the time I have, I probably want to uh, stop here and to see if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to go into the detail that I didn't get the opportunity to get into and due to limited time. And thank you so much for your time and attention. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Larry. Uh, really, really nice presentation. All of your visuals and your videos really helped me understand your research a lot better. So I thought that was really nice. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll field one, one more question. Uh, if anybody has other questions, uh, feel free to send them to us and um, we will reach out to you um, and follow up on those questions. So uh, would you please comment on the general types uh, and the status of the nanostructures that are being explored in your stretchable electronics? Sure. So here I probably focus a more on the laser induced graphene and uh, its composite. And because that material is highly porous with the nano to micro uh, pore structure, so it can not only provide the uh, medium to transport the gas molecule, but when we get to use, maybe I can go back one slide here. Uh, when we get to use this material and the composite for the different components here, for example, for the sensors, we can monitor the um, ECG with the electrode with the string sensor and pressure sensor to monitor the pulse and the nice contact with the skin is very essential. And the highly conductive property is also very important because we want to reduce the power uh, consumption. On the other side, if we're looking at the micro supercapacitor and in general we want to make sure this type of device is charged really fast and to provide high energy and power density so in essence the highly porous structure and here is not the laser induced graphene alone but rather we can dope the material and also do the uh, composite material design to infiltrate the material with additional uh, uh, decoration and uh, for example, metal oxide 
and the other type of non-materials can be integrated onto the platform. But in general, the 3D scaffold provides a really high transport uh, speed in terms of the ions and the electrons. So the charging can be really fast. And with the 3D power structure, it can provide on both sides for the uh, charge storage. And so that inside the energy and the power density can be higher uh, when compared with some of the solid materials. Uh, on the other side, the triple electric uh, nano generator. So for that one, we want to make sure the charge separation and transport from the positive to negative can be fast and also to have a really high uh, voltage and power output. So the power structure of this uh, leading induced graphene composite is helpful here. But again, it does not need to be limited to the uh, power structure uh, of the laser induced graphene, but it can also be the others. And for example, uh, the other type of nanomaterial that are growth uh, or synthesized from different matters can be very useful as well. It really depends on, for example, what's the particular um, uh, application and any particular nanomaterial with different properties. Uh, for example, sensing properties, if we want to go after uh, the other type of uh, biomarker, I mentioned, for example, glucose, lactate. And if you want to monitor the uh, mental health, you probably want to detect the cortisol. Uh, if you want to go after the infection, you can detect uh, 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 cytokines. And so all of those things can be uh, detected if you have a proper probe. So if you have just this nanomaterial in terms of laser-induced graphene, it's not going to work because it does not provide a highly selective detection. So that's why we are also trying to modify the material with the corresponding probe to design that composite uh, uh, in a correct, correct manner. So that's why we are trying to integrate, for example, enzymes, aptamers, and some of those molecular traces that can select it bound to the target molecule. And that's really something uh, very useful because here, uh, as you probably noticed, we integrate the gold on the surface of laser induced graphene. And gold or linkage can actually help us to directly bound the material with the aptamer. So the aptamer based sensor can be easily realized with this device. But of course, that's certainly not uh, to be limited by these certain materials. But other materials with different structures or different uh, type of materials directly integrated can be very helpful as well. Excellent. Thanks, Larry.